Hello. Hello. Okay, you can still not see you. Now we have picture and sound. Is that right? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So, are you ready to start everything, or you need a few minutes to prepare? I need approximately ten seconds. Okay. Then I'll be ready. Turn it off. And if I share my screen. Wait, so I can do a first short introduction and then some housekeeping for the society and then you share the okay, screen. Sure. In that case, I'm ready whenever you're ready. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, so really, we're really grateful for you to be here today. Uh, before introducing the speaker and the talk, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're really grateful for everyone to join the event. Obviously, this is a whole society is geared towards spreading the whole information and science about quantum computing and quantum information to all of you. So thank you for all of you being here today. And if you, if this is your first event, I'm gonna share 
when Ross begins the Facebook page. And I think we have also Twitter now. You know, one of those things that we are expanding our social media. So please follow us and then see for our future events. And for next week, uh, we will have on Tuesday, making sense of quantum theory, the role of relations and information. It will be by Professor Carlo Rovelli, Center de Physique. He read the Lumini. I'm not sure where the university is, but it sounds a really interesting talk. So I will also post a sign up sheet for that talk. And then you can also join next week for another interesting talk about quantum information. But today um, we have Ross Duncan. So surely he did his PhD in Oxford, as I'm aware, in 2016. And now He's the head of quantum software at Cambridge Quantum Computing. He also partly works in the mathematical structure programming group at University of Strathclyde. So we're really grateful for us being here and uh, for another person from the company presenting a bit more of what you're doing and what are your interests are because we had a sneak peek of Ross last term because he appeared a bit in Bob's uh, Koch's uh, talk. <laughs> So that was quite funny. So it's really uh, nice that you're here today. And Ross will talk about ZX calculus, which is a diagrammatic or a way with pictures to understand quantum theory better. And uh, I think you Ross wrote in the, your description of the talk that quantum mechanics is hard to understand and I working with quantum mechanics, I can agree 100% that sometimes the notations are quite hard and you have to spend quite a lot of time on details. So it would be really interesting here how this kind of a picture way of looking at the whole theory would benefit to understanding it better in the whole uh, quantum theory. So yeah, so I will leave the floor to you. Again, thank you for joining us today and we're really interested in hearing about your work. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and yes, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the ZX calculus. So let me just see if I can start sharing my slides. So I think uh, I can't share them at the moment. So I think uh, you need to turn on something. Yes. Second. Mm. Uh, so now it should be. Yeah, so many, uh, many years ago, I did my, my PhD in, in Oxford, and then immediately after that, uh, are you looking at this screen now? Do you see slides? So yeah, we see slides, uh, introduction to the ZX calculus, and without anything else, so it should be great. Perfect. Yeah, yeah so many, many years ago, I did my, my PhD in Oxford with Samson Abramsky, and uh, around that time, the idea of trying to combine category theory with quantum computing was a very fresh idea that we, many of us were working on that around the time. And one of the ideas that came out of that just slightly afterwards was the ZX calculus, which in some ways represents the, uh, the, the failure of what we tried to do back in the early 2000s and was kind of reborn in this new way. So I'm gonna to try to explain a little bit about that and hopefully show you some examples. So it's quite possible I'm going to totally overrun my time. So just interrupt me with any questions that you have at any point. Um, okay, so nowadays I am I'm working in the private sector in a company called Cambridge Quantum Computing. And we have our main site in Cambridge and also in London and a few other places. And the thing that we do in this company is mostly making quantum software. And that, in a sense, grows out of, of the intro of what the ZX calculus is really all about. And so let's move on to uh, thinking a bit about what that actually is. So there's lots of different ways one might understand what the ZX calculus is. The first thing we could say is that it's a formal theory for quantum computing, which means that we have some kind of syntax. And OK, it's going to be diagrams. And these diagrams represent quantum processes. And it has axioms, which are expressed as equations. Again, it's equations between diagrams. But we understand these diagrams mean something in terms of linear algebra. So every diagram corresponds to linear math, which is supposed to be something 
meaningful in the world of quantum computing. So that's that calculus as a formal theory. You can be more concrete and ignore what it's supposed to mean and think of it just as a system of graphs and graph rewriting. So I have a language which is all labeled graphs and I have some rules that say when I can rewrite them. And these rules are effectively equations. So if I can rewrite one graph into another graph, then I'm, I think that these words in my language should mean the same thing. And there is a notion of computing here by doing these, these rewrites. So if you don't know what double push out rewriting is, don't worry about it. It's, uh, it's not important for anything else I'm going to say. Uh, a third view on the same topic is think of them as tensor networks. So if you have a background in, in physics, in particular in condensed matter physics, you've probably met tensor networks before. Here we have a, a network where each node corresponds to a tensor. So think of, it, of a matrix in a very simple case. And the wirings between them basically in, indicate how you're supposed to um, contract or multiply these different linear, linear algebraic gadgets. But unlike in normal tensor networks in ZX calculus, we also have laws, equational laws, to say when you can look at different presentations of the same tensor, how to move between those different presentations. And of course, it's, it's based on category theory. So one could think of it as a, an algebraic theory in the world of categories. In particular, for the experts, this is going to be a prop and the morphism to the diagrams of the ZX calculus. And then we have a lot of distributive laws between the different structures that show up inside here. And probably the most interesting one for the people in the audience today is we can think about ZX calculus as a way of representing quantum programs. And this method of representing them doesn't depend on the particular architecture of the machine or the choice of the, the gates that you might be able to do. It's more of a formal theory and the operations of the X calculus are actually more primitive than the usual unitary operations that you meet in standard quantum computing textbooks. So that was all very high level and I'm going to try to explain in a bit more detail what we're actually talking about, but I want you to try and bear in mind there's lots of different ways to perceive the same structure. So before we get onto that, I suppose we should think about why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, since you are the Quantum Information Society, I suppose I don't need to really tell you too much about quantum computing. Um, but the idea is that if we can use quantum effects in our computation, we can do more things faster, better, cheaper, and it's just going to improve the world of computing in terms of what is possible, or maybe I should say what is feasible instead of possible. Um, and then if we think about the relation of quantum computing and classical computing to try and make an analogy. And the analogy that I wanna make is if you think about classical computing, at the bottom of this tower of abstractions, we have electronics, which is the real physical behavior of current and wires. And that's what's actually happening. To, that's, our computations are that at the bottom. But we do some abstraction on top of that and we think of it in terms of um, binary values. So now we're looking in this, this digital world instead of thinking about currents moving in wires. But even this is still extremely primitive. So we typically want to put some level of abstraction on top of that. So maybe a functional programming language like standard ML, uh, which is now giving us another layer of abstraction on top of the raw binary layer, which enables us to start thinking about what it is that we want to do with this program. And Inside the programming language, there's of course some underlying logic and that underlying logic might be expressed in some kind of formal structure like the Lambda calculus. Um, and so that Lambda calculus has got really nothing to do with current and wires, but it's telling us all about what computations are rather than what electricity is. Now, if we go to the world of quantum computing, okay, I have the physics at the bottom, maybe it's the, some ions in an ion trap or some optical setup and there's something physical happening here. And we have our mathematical abstraction of all of that into Hilbert spaces and the associated pieces of linear algebra. But what actually is the, the logical structure of a quantum computation in the same way that the Lambda calculus is the logical structure for a classical computation? And it's not really an idle question because 
if we try to understand what our program is doing in terms of the current that's flowing in the chip, we have absolutely zero chance of understanding this. Even thinking about it at the level of the binary operations, it's almost impossible to understand. So we need this abstraction in order to reason about programs so we can write them and know what it is that we actually wrote down and what's going to happen when this program runs. And the way that we always attack such things is with more abstraction. Uh, this picture I'm showing you is from an old paper and it describes one way of implementing an 8-bit adder using the one-way model of quantum computing. The only thing that you really need to understand about this is that this corresponds to Hilbert space whose dimension is 2 to the power of 1764. Now, if you wanted to try and think about unitary matrices acting on Hilbert space of that size, you simply can't write down that kind of thing. So we can't use the normal uh, matrix-based approach to quantum theory, quantum mechanics, to talk about even very simple computational artifacts because this, the dimension of the state space is going to be too big and it's just going to be completely infeasible. So we do need to do some kind of abstraction here. And that's what the ZX calculus is for. And we can't um, act, abstract out the things which are unique to quantum theory. So when we're writing down some kind of abstract axiomatic theory about quantum computing, it actually has to have an answer to what's special about quantum. Why is it different to what happens in a classical computational scenario. And we don't want any kind of hand wavy argument about it. It's got to be like a mathematical answer to the question. Right? Now, if you would read the popular press or lies, as I call it, then you might think things like, oh, what is different in a quantum computer, a normal computer, is that things can be on or off at the same time. Right? You might have heard that somewhere, um, but if you have a physics education, you quickly realize that they're just talking about the fact that we're working in a linear setting where things can be added together. And other linear settings include your guitar strings and waves in a pool of water. And those are obviously not quantum systems. So why is quantum different? The answer is not because we can do superposition. Otherwise, we could have done it by throwing rocks in a pond. Another candidate, and this is a bit more promising, is the idea that quantum information can't be cloned and quantum information can't be deleted. And there are two famous theorems that say exactly this. And we're going to come back to this idea later on. But this is clearly not the whole story either, because the idea of linear types in computing has been around since at least the late 80s. And this is basically saying that in some situations, certain resources that you need in your computation can be used as often as you like, and others can't. And this is hardly um, a, a groundbreaking change of, of, of the rules of physics, because in the original papers of, of linear logic, um, Johnny Girard is talking about buying cigarettes. And like everyone knows that money is not a resource that you can infinitely use, and cigarettes neither. So this idea that resources can't be copied is already in the classical world. But it's quite an interesting idea for quantum computing to think about separating the regime of classical data, which can be copied from the quantum data, which cannot. But that's not enough. We need, we need more. And you may think it's got something to do with non-locality or contextuality. But again, this is not so straightforward either because there's more exotic theories, which are not quantum theory, that have also got these features. And some of those features apply in classical settings as well. It's, it's, this is a good contender, but I think it's not so simple either. So what I'm going to focus on is perhaps the most under, misunderstood word in quantum theory, which is complementarity. And so this was an idea introduced by Niels Bohr. And he says, oh, I'm not going to try to say in his words, but to paraphrase, it says that quantum systems have got properties which can't be accessed at the same time or can't even be simultaneously well-defined. And so two complementary properties and the usual example is position and momentum. If you know one very well, then the other one isn't defined or is, is unknowable, not just unknown, but unknowable. And this is a very distinctive feature of quantum theory. And that's what I'm going to try to axiomatize and use in my formulation. Okay, 
So just for the sake of setting up some common language, I will quickly go through some uh, basics of quantum computing. Um, I think most of this will be familiar to everyone, but I just want to make sure that we're all speaking in the same words. Um, so it should definitely not be more than five minutes for you guys. Okay. So what are we talking about here? So quantum states, they're vectors in a Hilbert space. And because they're vectors, I can add them up, I can multiply them by a constant. And we think about the qubit, that's a two-dimensional vector space, and we usually represent it as a point in the subversive of the block sphere. So here's one of the basis vectors, conventionally called zero, the other one conventionally called one. But any linear combination of those things is also valid. If I have two quantum systems and I want to put them together to make a bigger system, I take their individual state spaces and I form a tensor product. In turn, this means that the dimension of my Hilbert space is going to multiply each time I go up. Uh, third axiom is that for every discrete moment of time, the system is going to evolve according to a unitary operation. In particular, unitary operations are reversible. Right? And we have some conventional choices for what these will be. So we'll see these names again later. X, Z, and H are common operations on a single qubit. Control X, Control Z are common operations seen on two qubits. So here is an example of uh, a single unitary operation, which would just be to rotate the qubit, so rotate the sphere around the Z axis. And that's called Z beta if this angle of rotation is beta. Okay, so we can put those things together into what's called a quantum circuit. And the idea is that I have some qubits at the beginning and I'm going to act on those qubits with unitary gates. And those gates will probably act on either one or two qubits. More is, is possible, but the most common scenarios are just one or two qubits. And as we go through, by the combining these unitary gates in, in parallel and also in sequence, we're building up a bigger unitary operation, which is the effect of the total circuit. At the end, we'll have our output register of qubits, which should be in some new state based on whatever circuit this was. And I'm going to call a model of quantum computation universal if it can do all of the unitary maps. And it turns out that you only need a small set of gates to be able to build every other unitary operation. So the, the Z beta or Z rotations in general, the Hadamard gate, which is this matrix, and the C naught gate, which is a two qubit operation. And these three uh, turn out to be enough to make everything else. It's going to be slightly more convenient in this talk to use a different set of uh, generating gates. So I'm going to replace the H gate that I had before with X rotations. It's still the same set of, it still generates all the unitaries, but I prefer to have this nice symmetry between Z rotations and the X rotations. Uh, you might have guessed that was coming because the X calculus is called the ZX calculus. And with these generators, we can start to build little circuits like this. So I can start with two zeros. I can do a Hadamard gate on one side and then do uh, a C naught. And this would prepare a bell state or I could have my two qubits coming in to Hadamard, do a C naught to another Hadamard. And this would implement another gate called the controlled Z gate. Okay. So that's that. Um, Quantum observables. So this is what the point of what complementarity is all about. So an observable quantity in mathematics is going to be represented by a certain kind of operator. And the, so let's say it's going to be spin on the x-axis. So if I want to measure this, this quantity, I, I mathematically, I look at the eigenvalues of that operator. And so if my system is in a certain state and I want to observe O, then I can, see the eigenvalue EI, sorry, sorry, my eigenvalue lambda I uh, is given by this, this probability here. So there's some missing um, absolute value sign here. And then if I do see that outcome, then not only have I um, observed the outcome, but I've also changed the state. So my original state is lost and I now have the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue which I observed. And that's going to happen probabilistically. So if we look at the uh, some arbitrary qubit state like this one, alpha zero plus beta one, I could do a Z measurement and I have these two possible outcomes, zero and one, with some probabilities which are based on 
these alpha and beta values. If I do this different measurement, x, I could see these other two possible outcomes with these other two probabilities. But the interesting situation is when my initial state was actually already an eigenstate. And in this case, if I measure z, when I'm already in the zero state, the zero state's already an eigenstate. So probability one, I just see the thing that I already have, and probability zero, I see the other one. However, if I measure x, then I have equal probability to see both of the two x outcomes. So this is an example of two things which are complementary. In this particular state, I have a perfectly well-defined z, so I have probability one knowledge of what this is, whereas I have maximum uncertainty about x, because so I have equal probability to see the two possible outcomes. Okay, and so in general, if we have this situation, if I have two different measurements I can do, then doing them in a different order can give different answers. Okay, so not every observable is well-defined at the same time. And we'll say that two observables are compatible if they commute. And if they're commuting, they have the same eigenvectors. So we might as well just say that an observable is the, the basis of eigenvectors. So in more pictorial terms, I think of every observable as defining a basis for the, for the space. So a set of axes of the space. And if they're incompatible observables, they don't define the same axis. So, so the, green, the, the green axis here called labeled A would be an observable which is incompatible with the red ones. And if they're as incompatible as it's possible to be, then we call them complementary. Right? And so here's the expression saying that the inner product, which is to say the, oops, that's not what I expected to happen. The inner product between the red vector and the green vector is everywhere the same, no matter which green vector and which red vector I pick, and it's always determined by the dimension of the Hubble space. And in this case, the two bases are called mutually unbiased. But that's going to be important later. Okay, so that was physics. Was that five minutes? It's about five minutes, right? Okay. Let's move on. So diagrammatic languages. So my upbringing is as a computer scientist. So I operate with what I call the pessimistic diagram convention, which means that I start at the top and I arrive at the bottom. Okay, so this is the opposite of what most physicists do, but this is the way that all my diagrams are gonna go from top to bottom. So why would I like to have a diagrammatic language in the first place? And I think I can make this really obvious to you by asking you, tell me what this is. So this is a certain quantum circuit written down in matrix form. Or is it? I could just be lying to you. You can't even tell, right? I, I mean, I can ask you, what is it? I guess that's a little bit hard for you to say just looking at these matrices. Um, but maybe it's more reasonable to ask you, what dimension is this matrix? Does that seem easier? Probably, probably not. Is this even a well-formed expression? Or if I made some mismatch in the dimensions of the things that I'm multiplying together here? Again, it's pretty hard to tell just by looking at this. So in a nice diagrammatic representation, we can have all those kinds of questions answered just by looking at the, the picture. So these kinds of diagrams are very good when we're thinking about systems where I could put things together in parallel or in sequence, like in, in the matrix algebra we just saw. If we're thinking about operations which are algebraic and co-algebraic at the same time, so algebraic meaning I have lots of inputs and one output, co-algebraic meaning the opposite, then having diagrams is almost essential. And the, if we're thinking of the level of category theory, then the shape of the diagrams themselves tells us quite a lot about the algebra of the, of the category. So some good historical examples, we have the digital logic circuits or quantum circuits. We have Feynman diagrams, which are talking about the propagation of particles. We have the negative dimensional tensors introduced by Penrose, which is a very early form of tensor networks. And this was particularly uh, important work influencing what we later did in ZX calculus. In the world of, of logic and linear logic, the, the idea of proof nets from Jean-Yves Girard and various others over the years since then. And also in this two-sided form, which looks a bit more like the diagrams that we're talking about. Um, or perhaps the interaction combinators of Yves Le Fon. And so interaction combinators is a very simple diagrammatic language. These are the equations 
this is a Turing complete computational language. In the world of category theory, there's a lot of diagrams, although often they're pretty well hidden. So that's a description of a diagram there. Good luck on unpacking that one. It took quite a while of reading to get it. But other people have done more obviously diagrammatic things in the world of tensor categories. So Jaya and Street's work is extremely uh, important to us and also with the extensions with Jaya Street and also uh, Dominic Verity did later. Okay, so that's some history of why diagram, of the many places where diagrams have been used in what we might call real mathematics. So we're not the first people to, to realize that it's quite often useful to draw pictures instead of writing down long algebraic expressions. So the kinds of diagrams I'm going to be talking about are what are called string diagrams or they're the diagrams of monoidal categories. And they all look like this. So I have some kind of a box and it has wires coming in and has wires coming out. And so the wires coming in, they might have labels and they're the input systems and, and the output systems are the wires on the other side. And in between, there's some kind of interaction or a process is happening or a change of a state or expression of some kind of relation between the inputs and the outputs, but something is happening. Now, for this to be a monoidal category, I have to have some way of combining these kinds of diagrams. So let's imagine that I've got these three little drawings, F, G, and H, and I have different ways to combine them. So the most obvious thing I can do is I can plug the output of one into the input of the other. And since they're both labeled by the same thing, that's okay. And that's called composition. And another thing I could do is I could take them and I could put them side by side. And that's called tensor. And if these things were valid diagrams, then so is this, and so is this. And the theory of monoidal categories has a whole bunch of equations, and it all sounds quite intimidating. And it can be summarized very briefly by saying that these three diagrams are unambiguous. Uh, so if I wanted to write this down in normal mathematical notation, I would probably have some brackets somewhere, and then I would have to have some equations saying, when it mattered which way around I put the brackets, like an associative law. But if I just say these diagrams are unambiguous, that's enough. That covers all those kinds of associativity equations. Okay. Uh, and there's one more point on the subject that I should mention, which is what does the blank paper represent? And the blank paper represents in, in algebra it's called the unit object. We can just think of it as the empty system, the, the nothing. And so if I have um, a system which starts from nothing, I can, I can produce things from nothing. So you could think of this as introducing a fresh thing into my system. Um, or I could have some other process which takes an input and consumes it and produces nothing. And I can put the creation of a fresh thing into the process which destroys it and have something which starts from nothing and produces nothing. And mathematically, that's going to turn out just to be a number. Yeah. And if you know Dirac's notation, this is a good time to tilt your head 90 degrees to the side. And you can see this is the bracket notation written. Uh, here's the bra, here's the cat, here's the bracket. Yeah. It's the same thing. And I'm going to now suppress 50 years of, of mathematics with one slide and say that, okay, I'm gonna draw all kinds of diagrams using these pieces. And the theorem says that if the diagrams can be bent and warped one to another, then they're the same. They, they are the same object. Uh, and so we call this the only the topology matters uh, principle, but it's actually a long tower of theorems with different kinds of categories. But if you're operating in any of these string diagrams, all I'm saying is that all that matters here is how the pieces are wired together, not how they're laid out in the page. Okay, so this is the kind of diagrams we're going to use to build the ZX calculus. And so let's um, let's do a little bit more, more physics, then we get into it. So the first thing I want to just define is what do we mean by an observable? I mean a basis from an underlying Hilbert space. Okay. Um, I'm always going to have a finite dimensional space, so I can just count the, the basis vectors one up to D. And for our purposes, D is always, always going to be two. So it's not going to be too complicated. 
All right. Now remember these theorems from earlier, the no cloning, no deleting. So what is it, what does the no cloning theorem say? It says that if I've got some operation, which is called D, and it can copy some, um, some state psi, so I've got one psi at the beginning and I've got two psi at the end, and there's some other state, which we call phi, which D can also copy, then it must be true that psi and phi are orthogonal, which means that you can't just give any old state to, to this copying operation and expect it to be copied. It, no operation can do more than copy a, specific, a very specific number of things. And similarly, I can't erase quantum information in a uniform way. So if I've got an operation E for erase, it's going to send psi onto this constant uh, state here and also phi to this constant state here. Then those two things must have been orthogonal as well. Okay, so quantum information can't be copied and it can't be erased. So, but I want to turn that on its head, right? So I said, if it can be copied, they must be orthogonal, which is another way of saying that if I know that a certain quantum state is a member of a given eigenbasis, I can treat it as if it's classical information and I can copy it and delete it as fr freely because I know it's in a certain basis. And then these kinds of copying and erasing operations are pretty easy to create. Uh, and so in that sense, being a bit, as we defined earlier, a basis is an observable. So the ob way to formalize what an observable is in a, without referring to the underlying Hilbert space is to formalize what does it mean to copy and delete things in a diagrammatic way. And that's what we're gonna do. So this is called the uh, Kolmanoid laws, but let's start up here. So I have this operation delta, which is gonna be for copying. So one thing comes in, two things come out. Now, if this really was a copying operation, I would expect it to obey certain laws. And these are the laws written here. So if I make a copy and then I copy the cop one of the copies, it doesn't matter which copy I copy. Similarly, if I have my copying operation here and I switch the two copies that I make, they should be the same. So it doesn't matter if I cross the wires here or not. Right? So this is saying that the copies are the same. And if I have also got this erasing operation, if I make a copy of something and then I erase one of the copies, that should be the same as doing nothing. And similarly, again, it doesn't matter if I erase the left copy or the right copy, they're both the same as the original. So these are the laws of being a co-commonoid co or more accurately, a co-commutative commonoid. And that's basically what does it mean to copy things? And I can also think, about what it means to do the, these copying and raising operations backwards. And so I get some kind of some other operations which take in two inputs and produce one or take in no, no input and produce some kind of predefined state. And since I've obtained these by just turning those upside down, these will also obey the laws but turned upside down. And now we know that these two things are what we call monoid, which is a very simple kind of algebraic structure. And I won't go into any more details of this, but if you think about it a bit carefully, you can see there should be a few more equations which should hold, and that's these two things. Uh, so if I have two, two things wired together like this, two copies of the same, uh, so this will turn out to be identity, and, and I won't even bother trying to explain this one. But in summary, if I have a colonoid, a copying and erasing operation, and I have its dual thing, and I put them together, the entire thing should be called, uh, is, is a gadget in mathematics called a Frobenius algebra. And the important theorem is that these Frobenius algebras are um, in exact correspondence with bases, which means they're in exact correspondence with uh, observables in our quantum setting. So my little funny equations about copying things turn out to be an exact axiomatization of what it means to be a quantum observable. Now we want to talk about complementary observables and I'm just showing you this slide to remind you of this picture here and the fact that they're on, a, uh, on the same inner product between all the vectors. But if I do a little bit more work, which I won't do in this talk now, I can prove another interesting theorem which says that if I've got two observables, 
then they're strongly complementary, which is a bit more than complementary, uh, if they form a Hopf algebra. And I'm going to show what that means in a second. But basically, I've got my four operations for each observable. And so if they're observables, if I bracket them this way, then this one is Frobenius, and this one is Frobenius. And if these two observables are complementary, then if I bracket them that way, they're Hopf algebras. And being a Hopf algebra means some additional equations apply, and that's these four equations here. Okay, so it sounds scary, but it is just these four relatively simple equations. And so that's the underlying algebra that we uh, formalized to try and capture quantum mechanics. And we're going to be a bit surprised of how, how much it does, in fact, capture. All right, finally, I can introduce what this is. So the ZX calculus is a language which is based around graphs. And the graphs have got two kinds of uh, nodes, one which is called Z and it's usually colored green, and the other is called X and it's usually colored red. And these nodes can have labels and the label will be uh, an angle. Now, any graph at all with this labeling scheme is a valid diagram in the ZX calculus. So here's an example uh, of a valid diagram. Again, from reading from top to bottom, I've got no labels here apart from the colors. So if I don't write an angle, that means the angle is zero. Uh, and so here's one qubit coming in and seven qubits coming out. So this particular diagram looks kind of weird, but it's actually a circuit which is the encoding circuit for a certain quantum error correcting code. And I'll go, in a few slides time, it'll be kind of obvious how we start to build up things like that. So I want to associate to every one of my diagrams some, some linear map, and I do it this way. So I've got n inputs, and I've got m outputs. And the idea is if I have zeros coming in, they just go out. If I have ones coming in, they pick up this phase. And the alpha that, of the phase they pick up is the alpha that labels the node. And the red one is exactly the same, except instead of being in the Z basis, we're in the X basis. And so I can, now that I know what linear map corresponds to every vertex in the graph, I can just join together those linear maps to get linear map for the entire graph. So if we come back to things which are probably a bit more familiar. Um, if I want to write down what's the zero qubit in ZX calculus, it looks like this. So nothing comes in and a one qubit comes out. The one qubit, usually written this way, I have nothing coming in, I have one qubit coming out. For the, the plus state, it's exactly the same, except it's the Z green one. And for the minus, it's also pi with a green color. I can write down the Pauli matrices. So here's an example of the uh, Pauli X, which is labeled by pi. And here's the Pauli Z, again, it's labeled by pi. And I can generalize this to make any kind of um, Z or X rotation I want. So here's the, the Z rotation, here's the X rotation. And the last element I need to complete my, my universal set is the C naught. And it turns out that if you do this diagram and this diagram, the resulting matrix you get is exactly the same. So that's two ways to write down the C naught. In fact, there's going to be a bunch of other ways. And so the theorem then says that if we have any unitary map at all, there is a diagram that I can write down which represents that unitary map. And I can do this by thinking of it this way. I've got a translation from my circuit language into the ZX calculus. And since I already know that this combination of Z, X, and C0 is universal, then I can just translate my circuit directly into the ZX language and that will work. Uh, but we have more, we have lots of equations. So I'll run through this. So some of the equations come from the Frobenius structure. And this is probably the most important thing of the lot, which says that if I've got two things which are wired together and they're the same color, I can merge them. Uh, if I have a self loop, I can throw the loop away. And if I have something which is labeled by zero with one in, one out, I can just drop the, the vertex and replace it with an edge. Um, okay, 
Uh, I have some other equations which come from Hopf algebra, which I'll mostly skip over here. But I want to just highlight this one quickly because um, it carries some of the intention that if I have maximum knowledge of one thing, that I have no knowledge of the other. So you can think of this as saying that I've got some something encoded in the Z basis. And I'm trying to transmit it to something which wants to read it in the X basis, except because these things are in complementary observables, my, I drop the wires. So it's actually not possible for me to transmit information in this way between the two colors. Um, I have some other, some other rules which I'll skip over. So this comes down to strong complementarity. And then I have this very strange looking equation, which is very specific to the case of qubits, which I will not um, dwell on just yet, but it will resurface in a little while. Um, okay, and then there is a theorem which says that anytime I can use those equations uh, to transform one diagram into another diagram, it means that the, the matrices they represented were equal. So anything, any proof that I do using my diagrams is valid about the underlying system, which is a kind of minimum thing that you would want. Otherwise, you're just telling stories. Uh, in fact, the converse is also true, that if two matrices, sorry, if two diagrams represent the same matrix, then there is a way to rewrite one into the other. That is much harder to prove, uh, but we, so we won't do that today. Um, okay, so the Hadamard matrix uh, has made an appearance earlier. It's quite an important element in quantum computing generally. This is one way of representing it. It's not unique. Um, but because it comes up so often, I'm going to give a special notation for Hadamard. And now with this notation in mind, we can see what was the point of the weird rule from earlier. So if I take my green dot and I surround it with Hadamards and then I unwind the Hadamard according to its definition and then I use my weird rule and then I see that this is pi by two and this is minus pi by two. So if I merge them together, that up, adds up to zero. So I can just drop all those dots. I can see that the Hadamard is actually giving me the symmetry between the X and the Z. And with that in mind, I can come back to some of my examples from earlier. So here is the circuit of uh, CZ. And you might know from your other um, knowledge of circuits, CZ is actually a symmetric operation, that it doesn't care which one is its left input, which one is its right, unlike the C0, which we see here. So if I do my naive translation of the C0 into the ZX language, I get you know, the same picture just with color. But if I use my Hadamard rule, then I can rewrite it like that. And now I can just see in the diagram that CZ is a symmetric operation because there's nothing to distinguish the left and the right sides of this picture. I can do uh, short little proofs about circuits. So this is a very common exercise in quantum computing textbooks. If I've got a C naught, a C naught the other way around, and then a third C naught, that should be a spot. Can I prove this? Yeah, it's this lot. It's probably easier than the corresponding matrix computation. Um, so all I've done here is used my one of my bi-algebra rules here, and then used my Hopf rule to remove those two wires, used my Hopf rule there again to remove those two wires, and then started deleting things which can be deleted. And for a slightly more impressive example, we could do something which is actually a real computation. So this is the translation of a two qubit Fourier transform into the ZX notation. So here's some input qubits. So this is one, this is zero. This is the Hadamard gate, and this is the controlled uh, Z pi on two gate. And if I take away the boxes here, and I just use the rules which I skimmed over earlier, I can simulate the execution of this circuit um, one step at a time. And so I can prove that this, in fact, is the Fourier transform, and it does what it's supposed to do. And if I translate those back to conventional notation, it gives me the right answer which is nice. Okay, I see that I'm a little bit short on time. So I will do one 
slightly more substantial example of the kind of thing you can do. And I'll stop at that point. So a couple of years ago, I was supervising an undergraduate project, uh, this guy, Liam Garvey. Uh, so this picture was taken when he first joined the university. So he looks less like a child nowadays, but uh, he was still pretty young at the time. And his project was to formalize this particular error correcting code in ZX calculus and to use a certain automatic theorem proving tool to prove that it was correct. And um, Liam is an electrical engineering student, he already was back then, and despite knowing nothing about physics, he got an A for his project. But he was able to use the, uh, the ZX calculus as a complete system for, for reasoning about these kind of quantum theories. So I'm not going to go through everything that he did, but I just want to show you one piece of it. So this uh, particular error correcting code, it encodes three logical qubits in eight physical qubits. So this is the encoder circuit for the code. So some inputs come in here and then a code word corresponding to those inputs comes out the other side. And the decoder circuit is just the other, it's the exact same thing in reverse. And there are some obvious questions like where are the measurements here? And they're suppressed, but if we are allowed to assume that the measurements have all gone and the plus one outcome, then it's exactly this. Now, the thing that we would like to know is if I encode something and then decode it, I mean, did I get the thing that I started? Like I would like to verify that I didn't make a mistake in programming this error correcting code. And so equationally that would come down to this. If I take the encoding circuit and I plug it into the decoding circuit, that should be the same as just wires, inputs just passing straight through. And the proof of that is um, not too short. So there's the first page of it, there's a second page of it, there's the third page of it, and there's the fourth page of it. But in fact, all of those steps were just very simple elementary rewrites of the kind that I showed you earlier. And they were all done automatically by the, the theorem prover. Um, so the theorem prover that we used back then is called Quantumatic. It's still being developed as a more general rewriting tool by Hector Miller Bakewell. Um, but you may also want to try out something else. So um, in Oxford, you may have met Alex Kissinger uh, or John van der Wettering, who are the implementers of a tool called PISIX, which is a Python package, which lets you manipulate um, ZX uh, diagrams and do lots of circuit simplification tools in the language there. And PISIX is competitive with the leading circuit simplifiers using all other formats as well. So this stuff really does work for real tasks up to the circuits of size tens of thousands. And a bit more recently, a team of researchers from Wolfram have formalized the ZX calculus using their Wolfram um, language, which is like a high powered uh, graphy writing system. And they started applying that to you to rewriting uh, ZX diagrams representing quantum circuits. So here's uh, their proof that quantum teleportation is correct. It's a little bit hard to understand because everything in the proof is happening all in the same place, but uh, that is again automated and you can check out their paper. And so I think a good thing for me to do now is not to babble on too much longer, but to stop and present you with the, if you want to know more, check out the website and I could stop here and take any questions. Cheers. Great, thank you very much. Uh, obviously you could have gone a bit longer, but maybe it would be best to get questions and then, yeah, maybe they will coincide with what you're supposed to talk. So I might start with just a technical question, understanding from your point of view, because you obviously use a lot of this tool, you know what it is. And then uh, what would you tell it's the most useful thing for now? You mentioned at the end, it's for simplifying your circuits. 
So for a practical man, is it um, only simplifying circuits or there's, I think, else proof? So what are the main avenues you think it's mostly used for? So I mostly use it for understanding the shape of things, basically. If you want to see what's really going on in terms of a quantum circuit or a tensor network or a certain kind of quantum state, then it's much clearer when it's written down in this notation because a lot of the equational structure, the commutation relations are just expressed directly in the language. So that's one thing. Circuit simplification, I could definitely show you a lot of things about that. Um, but a thing which I'm particularly interested in is the fact that the Xenix calculus isn't really committed to a particular model of computing. So if I want to switch between models of computing, for example, if I want to switch between the circuit model and the one-way model, that's more or less trivial in the ZX language. In fact, you can even have diagrams which in one place look like a circuit model and another place look like a graph state and, and move between them very freely. So in terms of doing translations between different uh, ways of representing the same state, it's extremely powerful for that. Um, I mean, so other people have been using it for things like error correcting codes. So this is an example of a, of a surface code. Um, this is a different example of a, of a topological code from, so this is from Tobias Fritz, and this is from Craig Kidney, uh, looking at different kinds of codes, but formalized using this kind of notation because it turns out to be extremely effective for that. Uh, some other colleagues have been working on how to treat the lattice surgery operations that you see in, uh, in surface code using the ZX calculus, because these Frobenius algebra operations of copy and co-copy in a, a surface code language, they would be called merge and split under the primitive operations of the surface code. And all the, the logical gates are built out of those things, whereas they are also the primitive operations in the ZX calculus. So it's, uh, it works very well on that, for that kind of thing too. Okay. Do you have an example like from not necessarily like uh, circuits, but from like condensed matter, or some other like physics area where they would use quantum mechanics in terms of like calculations and then use set of calculus to simplify their computation? So in condensed about. matter, I don't have any good examples. I mean, this kind of code is based on some ideas which were which come from condensed matter physics. So this is the surface code. Uh, however, there has been a bit of a new new work from Shan Majid um, formalizing a version of ZX calculus in um, what's called the braided setting, where the wires actually have non-trivial twists in them. And this seems to me a bit more appropriate for working with condensed matter systems. Okay. Great. So we have a few questions. The first one was from Anker, and the question was, how do you represent the measurement in the ZX calculus picture? Yes, good question. So there is uh, multiple possibilities here. So what I've been presenting is the, if you like, the classic pure state calculus. And the there is a way one could represent measurements in this calculus using labeled projectors. So I showed you earlier that I can represent the projection onto a given state by a, by a sub diagram with a wire going in and no wire coming out. So that is a projector. And so what I can do is extend, maybe I even have it on a later slide. Uh, but, uh, emissions. But so one option I have is I can just label this projection with uh, an index indicating whether it should happen or not. And then these indices form an implicit classical control. So this is the one I'm talking about here. So if I have here a Boolean expression as well as my angle label, I can use these kinds of conditional operations to represent measurements. Uh, precisely like this. So here I have X, which is a, a Boolean variable which corresponds to the measurement outcome. And that represents the, the two branches of the measurement. That's uh, a way which is quite well adapted for talking about 
measurement-based computing. Uh, another alternative is to switch to the more complex, um, what's the correct name for this? What's called the thin wire, thick wire version of the calculus, which is based on a kind of doubling construction. So you have certain wires which corresponds to quantum systems, which are the uh, thin wires, exactly as in my presentation. And then you have certain other wires which correspond to the classical information encoded in a given basis, which would be the, uh, the classical information. And so a measurement in that setting is represented by a node with a thin wire coming in and a thick wire coming out. And the color and label of the node is telling you what basis you did the measurement in. And that's equivalent to this, this setup that I have in my slide here. Um, for some things, it's more elegant. For other things, it's not. Um, and th those are the two, the two main ways you would do it. OK, thank you for that answer. Then there is an interesting question. Is there a generalization of the Z X calculus for density matrices instead of pure states? Yeah, so that's precisely what I was just talking about, in fact. So okay. the, uh, if we switch to this, this, this two kinds of wire formalism, then you can represent density matrices and CP maps and arbitrary channels in that setting. So you would input a density matrix and then you can man manipulate it with a calculus? Yeah, effectively this. There's, there's a reasonably straightforward way if you know the, the presentation of the density matrix as a sum of, of pure states then you can you can write down what the corresponding diagram is in the two wire form. Okay. Okay. Um, an interest a question I'm thinking how maybe how you would react. Essentially your your man has asked how is the coherence represented although yeah what do you have comment about that? And the ZX calculus? Yeah, it's not so straightforward, but it can be done. I say the calculus is universal, so it has a representation for every, every channel. Uh, with decoherence, is potentially quite complicated to write that, however. But if you know the Krauss maps, you can construct an appropriate diagram for doing it. Uh, obviously, it would depend on the, the time of which you want to allow the decoherence to happen. So this is a bit because you're not operating in a continuous time framework. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no, in fact, there's no natural notion of time in this language at all. That has to be imposed onto it. There's not even natural notion of sequence. So the causal ordering is not defined by the language itself. You have to ask for that on top. However, if you had a particular cross operator that you wanted to use to represent your decoherence, you can put it in, yeah. Yeah. But I, it's showing you only this pure state version of the calculus. You can't easily see it in this in this setting. Okay. Uh, David Benoit asks: Is it possible to use ZX calculus to simplify circuits in a VQE program? If so, how efficient is it at reducing the number of gates, for example? Interesting. So the answer is, is yes. Um, you can, of course, use it to represent ways of simplifying things. But it's really up to you how clever you are about choosing how to rewrite the thing, so that, how to rewrite your circuit. So it doesn't do, do magic for you, although it does have certain powerful normal form theorems, which can be very helpful and mean maybe you need to be a bit less clever. However, to be a bit more precise on this, uh, with some colleagues of mine, Will Simmons and Alex Cowton. Uh, last year, we did a paper about how to simplify the UCCSD ANSATs. So that's a particular uh, family of circuits which are used in chemistry calculations and are often used in combination with the VQE algorithm. And we showed that by using the, the method we defined there, which is all expressed in terms of the ZX calculus, um, compared to a naive method, we were removing about 80, no, 75% of the gates on average and 90% of the gates in the best case. 
So it's a, it's a fairly, yeah, you can do a lot. And there's a lot of recent work by John Van de Wettering and, and a bunch of other collaborators looking at reducing the number of T gates in fault tolerant circuits. And again, they achieve results which are as good as or better than uh, competing methods. Uh, and I should also mention Harney Wang and Neil de Baudra on that list of people as well. Probably a simpler one from Sultan, how to represent entanglement. Uh, entanglement. Well, this is in fact quite simple because we know how to represent gates. But since I have this, uh, since I have this slide open, I can show you in a, a more exotic entangled state. So mm -hmm. by, can I go backwards? Right. Uh, sorry. I, uh, no, let me just jump out of this because it's going to take me too long to skip through here. This will do. So a particular kind of graph of entangled state might be a graph state, right? So that's a particular form of state. And the way that you make a graph state, I have an undirected graph G and every vertex of the graph is a qubit, which will be in the plus state. And then for every edge in the graph, I put a CZ operation. So here's an example of how that might look as a circuit. So here's my qubits at the start and my graphs are just going to be a line in this example. And then I put a CZ between all the neighbors in the line. And my simplification, my spider rule, which is like the main driver of everything here, allows me to just merge those things together. And so you can see I've got one, two, three, four, five, six outputs here. And I'm not sure how long this chain is meant to be. So that would be a six qubit entangled state. So that's a six qubit graph state or longer, depending what the dots stand for. And again, I can simplify my notation and that would be what it would look like in the simplest form. So that's a six qubit entangled state. But if, if I wanted to have um, uh, a more complicated graph, like a square lattice, it's again like this. So this, comb this connection between Zeiss calculus and graph states is very, very tight. More generally, if I have any diagram which is disconnected, you know that those, that those two parts correspond to separable states in the Hilbert space. Now, if my diagram is connected, I might well believe that it's entangled, but that's not sufficient on its own. I would need to prove that I couldn't rewrite it to a disconnected thing. And there are lots of rules in the system which allow you to break connections. So it's not totally obvious just from looking at the picture whether it is whether it is entangled or not, but you could always know if it's not. Well, if the picture says it's not entangled, then obviously it isn't. Anyway, I hope that was, was clear. Can you like using those different packages can the, in the system deconstruct different bonds that you think that are entangled, but then they're not. So can you actually do Often, that? Yes. Fine. Okay. There, I, I don't think that there is any implementation uh, of any of the systems that we've been talking about that can definitively prove yes this is entangled for every imaginable diagram but quite often they do manage to separate things which are separable okay okay there's another question by timothy can you use zx to bound the number of cz cx gates one needs to represent the diagram of a given unitary operation to bound it. Uh, if you want, you can also read the question in the Q and A section. If that helps. Uh, I, think help. I think the answer is probably not. It's not a question I ever considered before. Um, I mean, I guess it's like this: if I have my initial circuit and I reduce it to something simpler in ZX language then I can read from the diagram that I need at least that many two qubit gates to implement this thing, because that's just the number of edges in the diagram effectively. Um, is that the, the lowest possible bound? That depends how good your simplification algorithm is. So, if, so I guess the answer is yes, you can get bounds. How good are those bounds? Who knows? Okay. 
have a question, not related to the talk, but since you're the head of the quantum computing at Cambridge Quantum, quantum Software, I don't know your exact title, but what are you currently working on with the company, like uh, in your division? Uh, we're like working on a lot of different things. Um, but from a scientific perspective, I think the most, um, the area of biggest interest for us right now is noise reduction. Uh, as you probably know, all existing quantum computers are really noisy. And if we can't do something about that noise, then we're not going to get anywhere with this technology. So we're investigating every, every avenue to reduce the amount of noise uh, that you find in, a, in an algorithm to reduce the effect of the noise that you can't get rid of on the results of the algorithm uh, and how to try to remove noise from the results afterwards. So all kinds of, all kinds of things to do with reducing the noisiness of, of quantum algorithms. Yeah, I imagine it's a hard task <laughs> when you hear that you need millions of qubits for simple tasks. If you want to reduce noise, yeah. I mean, even yeah. being able to characterize the noise in the machine past a certain size of the machine is very computationally expensive. So, as part of the the effort of learning about how to fix the noise, we also have to think about um, how to how to measure the noise in the device in such a way that we'll actually complete the measurement before the universe is over. So. Oh, that makes sense because it's hard to quantify how much of the noise will be present in your final answer. Yeah, I mean, I might know that a particular gate in the machine causes an error at some adjacent qubit, right? That's quite a common error channel in superconducting devices. Um, but I don't know a priori which, which pairs will influence each other. So I have to do some kind of experiments on the device to work this out. If I have to do full tomography on a 50 qubit device, then you know, I'll, they'll probably retire the device before we finish the experiments. Probably the last question. Are there, since we are not really waiting for, you know, uh, ex like, perfect fidelity machines. What are the avenues that you could use those noise machines and that those errors wouldn't really hamper the results much and it will be still useful, like in your opinion? Uh, I mean, at the current state of play, the errors are pretty pretty damaging for everything which you would like to do. Okay. Um, but I don't think that where people are going to be using these kinds of noisy machines for your classic combinatorial kind of algorithms. I think it's going to be simulation algorithms. And the hope is that at least in some interesting cases, the noise can be either mitigated or shaped into something that won't mess up your simulation. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much for joining today. Uh, had a lot of questions, a lot of interesting science, and yeah, hopefully everyone liked the talk. And thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, see you next time. Okay, bye.